Welcome to Willard Church of the Nazarene. We're glad you're here. We can't wait to share the service with you.
Turn your Bibles to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, beginning at verse 27. If you know where Jody lives, it's just on down past her house. Yeah. And we'll be stopping after there, after the baptism service for a light meal that she's prepared for us, right? <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> John chapter 4, beginning at verse 27. And before we get into that, let me just echo what's already been said about Roe v. Wade. Um, I didn't think this day was coming in, in my lifetime. Even when there were rumors about it a couple months ago, I was like, I don't think they have the votes. I thought one would not. Um, and so I'm praising God. But, but here's the thing I say with that. Rules are great, but I would rather see us have hearts that are bent in that direction. I would rather see us have a country that doesn't need that rule right? That we just have a, a great revival that takes over and that we would want to see our kids born. We would want to value all life in place of any law that, that has it. I'll take the law. I praise God for that, but I'd rather see it change in our hearts. But that's our goal. That's our mission, right? To win people for Christ, to share the good news so that people's hearts are changed. So our job is not over, right? Our job is still right there. There's still a lot to do. The, the harvest is ripe. Amen? Yeah. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word, if you're able? John chapter 4, beginning at verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her jar of water, The woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, would you give us soft hearts? Soft hearts to respond. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears? Lord, would you put an anointing on your word so that it rings true in our hearts, so that it speaks to us directly? Nobody wants to hear me. We want to hear you. Holy Spirit, you have your right of way. Do as you wish. Speak to us. Challenge us. Send us out from here. Lord, I pray for every other church that's preaching Jesus Christ today. Light them on fire spiritually, Lord, and send them out into this very dark world. Lord, give us opportunities to point people towards you. We ask this in the name above all names, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Going public. Going public, that's the title of uh, the sermon today, if you've read that, and hopefully you read all of John chapter 4. We're going to cover the first part here in a little bit. But we live in a very pluralistic society today. That simply means that people around us have very different beliefs, very different beliefs when it comes to life, very different beliefs when it comes to faith and, and science and, and all these other things. And because of this, there comes a question. The question, maybe two questions. The first is, should I be public with my faith and beliefs? And hopefully you answer that yes, if you do. Then the second question is, how should I do that? 
How should I share my faith? These are crucial questions for every believer, and they are also very important because you see how well we all get along together today, right? That's sarcasm. We are a nation that's constantly at each other's throats. Sharing your faith it ranks up there with politics, right? Not usually welcomed. So should we share our faith? And if so, how do we share our faith? Or, or how should you go public? Today we have a great example in God's Word that, that speaks to this, and I can't wait to dig into this. I think there are three answers to that question though, that I just posed to you. What do we do with our faith and beliefs? Number one, you can be private, right? You can not share your faith. You can hide it. Often this is done out of fear, though out of a fear of offending somebody, angering someone. Number two, you can share your faith, but you can do so in a, in a, a way that provokes anger in other people, right? I think we can all think of people like this. Number three, you can be open and public with your faith, but you can do so in a way that does not provoke people to anger. And I think the third option, of course, is the best option, and especially in a pluralistic society that we have today, it's probably the only option that we have. So let's dig into this, into this idea of public faith and what it means from this well-known passage of Scripture. I'm sure you are all familiar with this. We taught about the woman at the well not too long ago, but this narrative found in John chapter 4 is, like I said, well-known. The first part we didn't read, I'll catch you up on that, just in case if you're not familiar with that. The last part is, the last part of this interaction with this woman at the well is what we just read, and in the middle there's this metaphor, there's this image uh, that talks about sowing and reaping. And we'll come to back to that in a minute. But let me catch you up first on the, on the first part that we didn't read. So Jesus is traveling with his companions, with the disciples through Samaria. And they come to this well, right? Jesus stops there and the disciples continue on, continuing on to, to, into town to get some food and some, plot, some, some supplies. While this is happening, this woman comes out of town and comes in and meets Jesus. She's coming to draw water in the middle of the day, right? We know that. And Jesus talks with her one-on-one. -on -one. He engages her by giving her this another interesting more metaphor about living water. And he says that he has this water that if you drink it, you'll never thirst again, right? Of course, this intrigues her. And she's like, okay, give it to me. And Jesus replies, okay, call your husband, right? And what's her response? She tells him, I don't have a husband, and Jesus says, right. And, and, and without condemnation, he says, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, though, right? And the man that you live with right now is not your husband. When you first read that account, if you're like me, you're like, whoa. Jesus just kind of laid it all out there, calling her out. But what's he doing with that? Why does he reply to her request? Yes, give me that living water, right? Why does he reply, go get your husband, well, what he's doing, and he's doing so brilliantly, is showing her that this is not about the physical. This is not about the natural world. He's instead talking about something that will satisfy her, her, her soul's thirst, what she truly thirsts for, what she's truly been looking for, been hoping for, right? She's been looking for something. She's been hoping for something. And unfortunately, she's looked at it in this guy and then that guy. And then that guy, and, and it's been a disappointment to the point maybe where she's almost giving up and now she's just living with someone. This knowledge that he has about her and about her life, she, he knows what's happened, stuns her. And, and he's talking to her. Here this, this teacher, this Jewish teacher is talking to her and has concern for her. And right from the get-go, she can tell there's something different about this man, right? She looks at him and says, you, you know that when the Messiah gets here, he'll be able to explain everything to us. And very dramatically, Jesus responds, I, the one that is speaking to you, I am he, right? Verse 26, the very next verse is where we read and when the disciples returned and this is where she goes back to town 
Jesus then begins to engage the disciples, and it relates to the content of what just happened with this woman, what he talks about next. The disciples urge him to eat, right? But he says to them in verse 32, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Verse 34, my food is to do to the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. This is a, another illustration that he uses to teach him to Jesus Serving the Father, serving God is his food, right? To those of you that serve God, to those of you that are considering maybe serving God, this is very important for you to understand. This is extremely important. What he's saying is that um, serving God is not exhausting, right? It's not exhausting. Instead, it's sustaining it's like food to your body. People will often tell themselves or they'll often think to themselves that if I obey God, if I serve God, it's going to be exhausting. It's going to be tiring, right? I'm going to have to give up my freedoms in all of these different areas. I'm going to have to give up all the fun things that are in my life. It's going to be draining. That's what people think. But that's not what Jesus teaches right here. Jesus taught that since you were made for God, since you were made to serve God, that when you do that, it's actually food. It's actually power. It's actually sustaining you. It's actually filling you up. It doesn't tire you out. It doesn't empty you out. It actually does the exact opposite. It fills you up when you serve him. Imagine a fish that's flopping around on the hot pavement. We all know what hot pavement is this month, right? Imagine that fish on that hot asphalt or hot concrete, and it's flopping around. And then imagine, though, that fish gets put back into, its wa into the water. How that fish must feel, right? How that difference is when it's finally put back into its element, when it's finally put back into its element that it was created to be in. It, it has to be refreshing, it has to be invigorating, right? It's, it has to be a relief. That's what it's like to serve God, right? We all know that when we've served God, how amazing that makes us feel. How it doesn't tire us out if we have the right focus, right? It empowers us. It just encourages us to, to serve God more. Jody shared during Sunday school class about uh, how, how her students, how she's had an experience to, to, to share her faith with them and how some of them, eight out of ten, have, have, were able, all, ten of them went to this Bible camp and eight of them gave their life to Christ. What is better than that, right? What is more empowering than that? If I were to ask her, was that draining? Was that exhausting? Heck no, right? It was worth it 100%, right? And that's what it's like for you and me to serve God. Some of you think, though, it's just going to be exhausting. Look at what I'm going to have to give up. But I'm going to tell you, what you get back is so much more. Amen? Amen. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Here's another interesting part. What is he referring to specifically well he goes into this idea of spiritual sowing and reaping verse 35 don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest i tell you open your eyes and look at the fields they are ripe for harvest even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. This image of sowing and reaping uh, may seem out of place when you first read this account, like it was just stuck in here, but we have to consider it with the context of what's going on with this woman. It, it's all about finding Jesus and finding eternal life. That's what's going on with this woman. That's where this woman goes, right? She goes to share. How do we sow seeds? How do we do that it's simply or what's it mean it simply means to point people to jesus to point people to eternal life through jesus and that's what he's just done with her and that's where she's off to do with the town what about the reaping the reaping is when somebody hears somebody considers jesus christ and somebody makes a decision to follow jesus christ to make him their Lord and Savior, to put their faith in him. That's when salvation comes. Notice he says the sower and the reaper may be glad together. In our world, the sower and the reaper are never glad together. 
They're never side by side, right? Because you never plant a seed in the moment, moment that you plant it, you, you pull it up. It, it's grown. It's ready to be reaped. It's ready to be taken in, ready to be harvested. It takes months in between there, right? In a spiritual sense, though, that's the power of the gospel. They can happen side by side. So he's calling his disciples to do the, the spiritual sowing and reaping, to point people to him, point people to Jesus Christ and eternal life through him. He tells them, this is your food. Not your dessert. Not something that's optional. Not something that you should do every once in a while. You should decide if you want it or you don't want it. Not like dessert. I don't have to eat it. No, this is your food. This is your sustenance. This is what God has called each and every one of us to do. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are called to this. This is not a special anointing for a certain person. This is not a job of a pastor or just a Sunday school teacher. This is a job for everyone who calls Jesus Christ Lord. This is what he's called us to do. But we say it's still four months until harvest, right? That was the saying back then, and he's referring to a problem that apparently the people bad back then called procrastination. We don't have that problem today, right? You've never felt like the Holy Spirit is leading you to talk to somebody, and you've never said, uh, it'll be better if I just wait a little bit, and there, there'll be a better time to do that, right? You've never done that. The harvest is ripe, my friends, right now. If the Holy Spirit is leading you, there is no better time than right now to share your faith, to point people to Jesus Christ. Yes, we'll use every excuse. Yes, it's scary, right? It's still scary for me. It still causes me a little anxiety, right? But he's with you. He'll enable you. He'll guide you. He'll guide that conversation, just don't be scared. Don't put off the sowing, right? Don't say, I'll do it next time. He says, open your eyes. The time is now. The fields are ripe. We should be going public with our faith. We can't be people that hide it. So that's the call to the spiritual. That's the call of the spiritual sowing and reaping. And now maybe you're nervous, right? You know this is the call that God has given every believer, but it scares you. Hold on a minute, all right? We'll explain this a little bit more. And, and uh, this passage is going to help us to see that it's something that we can do. Okay, so how do we do it? This story gives us a picture of what it, will, what it looks like. The woman right? What does she do? She says to the people in verse 29, simply this, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah, right? Here she goes public, right? She doesn't hide what's happened. She goes to the people that she knows, and she is transparent about what's happened in this interaction, and she simply points people to Jesus. That's the call for us. That's the two essential parts about going public with our faith. Simple transparency and point people to Jesus. What do you mean by simple transparency? Well, simple transparency means that she says, look, there's a man who told me everything that I ever did, right? This is just, just her telling the people what happened with her encounter with Jesus. It's her testimony right? We all have a testimony about what Jesus has done in our lives that we can share. And you have to realize this about going public with your faith. You don't have to memorize this method of doing it. You don't have to memorize all these different apologetics things. You don't have to be an expert and know the Greek and the Hebrew. You just have to be willing to share your testimony. 
Some people are called to take that further. Some people are called to be evangelists. Some people are called to be apologetic people that know everything and can answer everything, and, and God bless them. And we should study apologetics. We should so that we have more answers. But don't let that get in the way of you sharing your faith. You have a testimony that you can share right now if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. You know the difference that he's made in your life. So don't let fear get in the way. Don't be worried about, I, I might not know an answer. Somebody asked me, yes, you might not know, but that's okay, because you can tell them, I don't know that. I'll, I'll try and look it up, but here's what I do know. Here's what Christ has done in my life. Here's the difference that he's made in my life. You can share about how God helps you deal with stress, right? Maybe an extremely stressful time in your life that you've been through and how you, you leaned on him and he helped you through it, right? You can share how you have some different priorities in your life compared to before you knew Christ. Before you knew Christ, you were all about working and making the dollar, right? But now you see that there's things that are more important. My, my time with my family is much more valuable than any money I can make, right? Whatever that difference is, maybe it's just simply I used to be so much, so much more focused in on myself than I am now. I told the class, we're going through this class on evangelism. I, I told the class, before Christ, I didn't like kids. I didn't want kids, right? And then I became a teacher at, at church, and I fell in love with these little kids, right? And then I became a youth pastor, and I fell in love with these teens, right? And then I wanted to have kids of my own. That's the difference that Christ has made in one little area of my life, right? I love kids. They're, they're amazing, I love teens. They have such amazing views and ideas, and they're so passionate. What difference has Christ made in your life? I, I told you uh, a year ago, man, I was dealing with anxiety, a lot of anxiety in my life. And I told you how I put my faith in him and, and trusted him through that and how he helped me through those things. You have something to share, Right? something that somebody needs to hear about the difference that Jesus Christ has made in your life. And God will give you that divine appointment with that person that's going through something that you've gone through. And you'll be able to share it with them. It's not only a good thing to share with people, but what I want you to realize is that it would actually be wrong not to share with people. Wrong. Dare I say, evil. Not to share. She says, come see a man What's remarkable about this is she's had one conversation with him. She's had one conversation with Jesus, she, and she's already pointing people to him. She doesn't know he's going to die for her. She doesn't know that he's going to be raised from the dead, and she's already pointing people to him. We know all that stuff, right? We think, oh, I don't know enough. She's had one conversation, and she's pointing people to him. Why? How could she? Why is she doing that? Have you ever thought about that? It's because she grasps the one thing that's unique to Christianity compared to every other religion, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. In all other religions, in all other religions, the most important thing is the way. It's the way you get to God. It's, it's what you need to do to find favor with God or enlightenment or whatever nirvana or whatever that is, right? It's the, it's, it's uh, one religion says that there are five pillars that you must follow and it's all about that. Another religion says that there's an eightfold path. There, another religion says that there's four noble truths and everything hinges on those things. And what you see in every other religion is that the way matters more than the person who brought the way or taught the way. If you're a Buddhist, the path to enlightenment, the eightfold path, it's more important than knowing Buddha. You don't even have to know Buddha as long as you can just follow that path. You don't have to know anything about him for the basis of enlightenment because it's all about something you do. Every other religion is about what you do to earn favor with God, how you 
ascend that mountain, how you make it to God. But we know that Christianity is completely different, right? In John chapter 14, Jesus says, you know the way to the Father. You know the way to God, right? And I love Thomas. He says, no, we don't. We don't know the way to God. And what's Jesus respond? I am the way, right? I am the way. Another time somebody says to Jesus, well, you have the words of truth. And Jesus says, no, I am the truth. Do you remember uh, Martha? She says, Lord, my dear brother Lazarus is dead, but I know that he'll rise in the resurrection in the last days. And what does he say to Martha? I am the resurrection. Right? This is the distinctiveness of Christianity. Jesus Christ does not come to tell you what you must do, how you must earn your way to him. He comes to be the way. He comes to make the way, right? He comes to do for you what you can't do. You can't be good enough to earn your way to heaven. You can't be good enough to earn righteousness. You can only get righteousness from what he's done. He doesn't stay, uh, go up this mountain to get to God. He says, hey, I'm God, come down to make a way, to be the way for you. So Jesus, not something you do, is central to salvation for Christians. Salvation only comes through a union with Christ. It only happens when we are in Christ, trusting Christ. And when you tell people that, some might say, well, that's good for you, but I believe this. I believe that there is more than one way. I believe that there are good people and they can go to heaven or, or whatever they call heaven. But when you say that, when they say that, you know that they really don't understand Christianity, right? Because when you're a Christian, you understand you're not a good person. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners. The only one good is God. We know that our goodness, the things that we do, will never get us to him. And that's why we praise God, though. Because he, in his goodness, makes a way. And this is the most freeing thing ever. You see, religion, trying to earn your way to God is exhausting. I remember early in my faith, trying to earn my way, trying to do everything just right, and it was exhausting. You know that the Jewish faith has 613 laws, right? 613 rules that you should follow. It would be exhausting just to learn 613 rules. When you understand Christianity, it frees you from exhaustion. It's like a weight is lifted, right? It frees you depending on your own goodness. And you simply depend on Jesus Christ's righteousness. Well, that's too easy because you could just depend on it and do whatever you want and not serve him. There, there's something to that. But you see, when you are in Christ, when you are depending on Christ, you'll serve him and, and you'll do that by being connected to him. When that happens, fruit will be produced. If you don't have fruit as evidence, though, the Bible tells you that your faith might not be real, right? You need to check that out because you need to be connected to him. If you're connected to him, you'll produce fruit. And that's the only way that you'll do that. If you're not producing fruit, then that might be a sign and that might be a, a real warning sign that you're in danger of going to hell. I'm afraid that there are going to be many people who call themselves Christians that stand before God, though, that aren't really connected to him, that aren't really in him on Judgment Day and are shocked by that. It doesn't matter if you come to church. I will tell you it is important to come to church, right? But that does not earn you salvation. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. It's being in him, dependent on him, realizing that you're not good enough and that the only chance you have, the only hope you have is him. You see, it's impossible to be a Christian and in Christ and not have your life point to Christ. Right? Not saying you're not going to make mistakes. We're, we're going to make mistakes. It's impossible to, about, to talk about your life, though, and not talk about Christ. Right? It would be like no one knowing that I'm married. That's how, how big it is. It can't be a surprise to somebody that you're a follower of Christ. Your life should speak to this. Your life should point to that. Your talk should point to it, right? Don't hide it. Come see a man. 
who flipped my life upside down. Come see a man who's wrecked my life in a good way. That's the essence of what it means to, to have a public faith. There's a lot of things that you can do beyond that, but that's what all of us are called to. We're called to share a testimony. We're called to point to him and tell people the difference that he's made in our lives and invite them to come check him out. Now, of course, some people have a problem with that in our society, right? Even if you do it in the best way. When I was on YouTube making videos, people would always say, it's fine for you to believe that, but don't push that on me. Don't shove that down my throat. Don't try and, don't try and tell other people about that and convert people. Imagine a group of families, though, that each family had a member with MS, multiple sclerosis, horrible disease, right? Imagine that they all started taking this, this new treatment, though, for it. And as a result, they saw immediate results, right? Most of them were cured or most of them, their lives were dramatically increased well, and, and got better. What if those families, though, got together and they shared their experiences with each other and they read up on it and they studied it and they came to the conclusion, man, the world needs to hear this. Right? So they formed a foundation. They created platforms and they tried to bring this information to the world. This is the cure for MS. You have to see this. You have to try this out. How would you feel if they came up to you and told you about that? Would you be angry at them? Or would you understand what they're doing and why they're doing it? Would it make you mad? No. You'd understand why they were doing it. And wouldn't you hear that message and evaluate it? Oh, they might make sense. They might have it. They might not. I'm going to look at it. It would be perfectly understandable, though, that they brought that message to you. How much more so with what we claim? Right? We're not talking about a cure for a disease. We're talking about the meaning of life. We're talking about eternity. Right? We should. We have a responsibility to bring that to those that we know, to those that are put into our uh, paths. What if somebody had MS and those people just kept that to themselves and never told them about it and they ended up suffering under that and ended up dying? Wouldn't that be a travesty? God forbid, right, that we don't share our faith. as somebody that needs to hear it. Of course we should share our faith. Of course, we should do it not in an overbearing way, right? Not in a harassing way. But as somebody that has discovered something amazing and just wants to share that experience with somebody else, right? Wants to share that good news with somebody else. Hey, check this Jesus guy out. This is what he's done in my life. You got to check it out. You got to learn about him, right? This guy's flipped my life upside down. Verse 27, just then as this, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Now, why were they surprised? You have to understand the cultural background. At this time, it was a patriarchal society, which men ordinarily did not talk to women in public. It was not the right thing, not the, the, the right cultural thing to do. Women were beneath them. In a patriar patriarchal society, though, Jesus talks to a woman. In a racist society, Jews did not talk to Samaritans. Samaritans, they were thought were beneath them. They were half Jewish and half something else, right? So they were despised. They were hated. In a racist society, though, Jesus talks to her. In a moralistic society, this woman had multiple husbands and was living with somebody, right, that she wasn't married to. It, it was pointed out in this passage that we didn't read that she, she came at a, a time when normal women would not come to draw water, pointing that she's a, a social or a moral outcast. In a moralistic society, this rabbi, this teacher, talks to this woman. That's why when the disciples show up, they're shocked, right? What's going on here why? Because here's this Jewish man, this Jewish male rabbi talking to this woman who's on the wrong side of every pecking order, every box that you can check, right, that the world can give. Why is he doing this? I can tell you why. He doesn't care, right? Let me say, he doesn't care about those boxes, about that pecking order from society, right? He doesn't care about her sexual past. 
He doesn't care about the fact that she's a woman, that she's a racial outsider, that she's a gender outsider, that she's a moral outsider. Why is he talking to her? Simply because he, he loves her. He wants to see her saved. His motivation is for spiritual sowing. He wants to point her in the direction of faith. He wants to point her to himself. Where, can she, where she can find living water, right? Where she can find what she's been looking for in all these men. It was a shocking love. The, the question for you and me is, how can we get this type of love ourselves? How can we get this type of motivation ourselves? Well, for me, it comes to looking at the cross, right? And remembering what my Lord and Savior did for me and how he saw me. And he was willing to take that on for me. On the cross, Jesus said, I thirst, right? That wasn't just a physical statement there. You see, on the cross, he took on our sin, and he began to be separated from God, separated from that living water. He was getting what we deserved, And we were getting the living water, right? Praise God. When you see that Jesus doing this for you, it turns you into a person that, who, who looks at other people and wants to tell them about this Lord and Savior that loves them so much. That the, this Lord and Savior who came down to this earth and lived this life, right, and served us while he was here, who humbled himself, to the point of the cross, to death on the cross. Making a way so that you and I could have our relationship with him and with the Father restored. With this woman, Jesus was able to say, I don't care about your past. I don't care about your sexual history. I don't care about what you've done or who you are. I can give you the water of life. Notice verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town. It's interesting that John includes this, right? It doesn't seem like a real interesting fact that she just forget it because she was in a hurry. Many commentators believe, though, that John was pointing this out to, to show that she actually believed Jesus. Jesus taught her, you're trying to get this living water the wrong way. I can give you this living water. And, and, and this was kind of a symbol of that. I don't, I don't need this water, this, this natural water. I don't need to find my way this way because I know about this living water now. She realized that the living water had been offered to her and she took it. She was taking it and she was going to tell other people about him. Come see this man, right? She said, he knew everything about me. You can imagine when the people of the town heard that, they were like, he knew everything about you. He knew about Tom. He knew about Dick. He knew about Harry. He knew about Bob, right? He knew about everything about you. Yeah. He knew everything about that. And he still offered me the living water. How could he talk to a woman like this? And then just offer her the living water on the spot. Shouldn't he have said, hey, you need to get right with this guy that you're living with. Either get married or move out, right? You need to straighten your life out. Quit living with that, that way. And maybe then you'll be ready for the living water. That's what we do sometimes, don't we? Maybe then you'll be worthy of this living water. No, he doesn't do that. Of course not, right? Right? Because salvation that Jesus Christ brings is a salvation by grace. Amen. It's a gift. If you're about some religion, maybe a form of what people would call Christianity, but you have to achieve your salvation, you're doing it wrong. You don't understand it. It's not something that you can accomplish. It's something that's been accomplished on a cross and proven in an empty tomb. 
So many different people are at this place, though. Social theorists say that a lot of people have this identity based on better difference. An identity based on better difference. One of the ways that people form their identity is to compare themselves with other people. And, and that's how they come to the conclusion that they're a worthwhile person. I'm a good person. You know I'm a good person because I'm better than that person. You see, that person is this. Or that person is that. But look at me. I, I work hard. I serve. I tithe. I follow the rules. I'm not like them. This is the Pharisees, right? That's where some people's identity, some Christians' identity come from. I'm different than them. I'm better than them. The non-believer does the same thing, though, right? I'm progressive. I'm open-minded, right? Not like these closed Christian prudes. I'm a free thinker. I'm a person of science. I evaluate facts and truth, and I don't believe in this makeup fairy tale stuff. I'm different. I'm better than them. And by comparing yourself to somebody that you would say is worse than you, you come to the conclusion that you're a good person. How off is that, though? Right? For those of us who knows, the Bible says there are none good but God. What if instead of finding your identity that way, that you know that, that salvation is not achieved but received? What if your salvation does not become come because you're better, but only because you admit you're not better. You're a, a sinner. You know that. And you know that the only chance you have is God's unmerited grace that has been given to you. What if your identity was formed in on that? How would you see other people that don't know Christ? What if you really understood that? Because some of us are, are doing all the things that... that God wants us to do, and we see other people, and they're not doing it, and we, that's all we can see. But what if we just stay in the place where we realize we don't deserve God's grace? Then when we see somebody else that doesn't deserve God's grace, we still extend it to him, and we still offer it to him. Be careful, Christians, in how you see yourself. What if you realize that you are given the living water as a gift in spite of your past? What if you gave that to somebody else? Despite of their past, despite of who they were. Maybe they're on the other aisle politically than you. Maybe they follow some other religion. Maybe they're a person who, who is an enemy of you, who does horrible things to you. Wasn't that us with Christ? Weren't we his enemies? Didn't he pray on that cross, Father, forgive them? for they know not what they do. Man, I want, I want eyes that see people like that because I form opinions so easily. I think people aren't worthy of the gospel if they're not how I think they should be. But all, all, right? The gospel is for everyone. And we can't make that distinction. All we can see are future brothers and sisters the potential for that, right? And that's the awesome responsibility that we have, the awesome bonus that we have. We don't have to judge people. We don't have to put people into categories. We can just say, do they need Christ? Do they need their lives to be changed? We can be a part of that. Lord, let us be a part of that. Give us an opportunity to be a part of that. Amen? You wouldn't need to see a person that needed to be better you would see a person that needed to be pointed to Christ and you would pray for that opportunity to do just that, right? So what's stopping you? What's stopping you from sharing your faith, from going public with your faith? She was public with hers and she knew a lot less than anybody in here, right? Right? You and I know about Jesus. So what's our excuse? You aren't responsible for another person's decision. You're just responsible to point them towards Christ and tell them what Christ has done in your life and encourage them to check this Jesus guy out, right? Some will reject that. Most will reject that. But that's on them. Let's give them the chance. 
Let's share what Christ has done for us. Let's keep pointing to Jesus, to the person that's changed our life, to the person that's flipped our lives upside down, right? You might not have a flashy testimony. I don't. But I can tell people that Jesus gave me a peace in the storm. I can tell people that Jesus is the rock that I cling to whenever something comes against me. Yeah, following Jesus doesn't make my life perfect, right? But following Jesus gives me a rock to cling to. My Jesus has given me a purpose. My Jesus has shown me what's really important in life. My Jesus has flipped up every idea I've had about what's important and turned it around. Let me tell you about him. Right? Would you stand with me? In a minute, I'm going to invite you up if you're one of the people being baptized, and we're just going to talk about baptism real quick, all right? But I just want to give you an opportunity to respond. Do you know him? Do you know my Jesus? He can be your Jesus too. If you'll surrender your life to him. He died for you. If, you, if you'll admit that you're a sinner, right? If you say, I'm tired of living that way. I've tried it. I've tried it with the five husbands, right? And I'm on number six. I'm tired of looking for the living water and the things of this world. It just does not satisfy my soul. I'll follow you, though. I'll admit that I'm a sinner, right? And I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my life to change me to change me to look more like you. I'm asking you to save me because I realize I will never be good enough. I have done way too many things wrong. You can make that prayer today. Amen? And, and let me put this on you, all right? You're called to share that with people. Don't you dare shirk from that responsibility. If you know Christ, you're called to share that. There's people around you, there's people that he's put in your past that don't know him. Share the truth. Share simply what Jesus has done in your life. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we pray for opportunities to share what you've done. Lord, would you put somebody weird in our path this very week? Would you give us a, a weird meeting with them? And Father, would you turn the conversation towards you? Would you give us an opportunity to share the good news with them? Father, I pray if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, I pray that they would determine in their lives to give their lives to you. Father, I pray that they would admit they're a sinner. I pray that they'd be praying right now, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong things. But Father, I want a different life. I want a new life. Lord, I need something that satisfies my soul because nothing is doing that here in this world. Would you do that? Would you give me that living water? Lord, would you come into my life? Would you order my life? Would you change everything in my life? And Father, would you help me to serve you and to share this with everybody else that I meet? Lord, we love you. We love you for the simple fact of what you've done for us on the cross for the new life that you've given us. Lord, we're thankful that you are willing to come down to this earth to, to, to be spit upon, to be beaten, to be insulted, to serve, to go without a house, to go without food at times, to be cold. You are willing to do that because you care about us. Lord, we thank you for that. And we give you praise. We hold your name above every name, Lord, for what you've done. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.